Welcome. This is Brian Wood, Medical Director for the Mountain West AETC Project ECHO Telehealth Program. Each of our weekly sessions starts with a short talk focused on issues relevant to HIV clinical medicine. The following talk was recorded live here at University of Washington. We will now take you to this week's talk. Thank you all for coming and listening to me talk one more time. I had a sudden realization 36 hours ago that I was supposed to give this talk and trying to figure out what was new and what I could share with you that might be relevant to PrEP. And I want to acknowledge that I have taken several cases that are loosely based in reality, some from PrEP facts, some from conversations that I've had. All of the details have been changed in order to protect the innocent, but this has come up several times in the last week or so of whether or not this patient who is either seeking HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis or on HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis and whether that patient needs PEP, post-exposure prophylaxis. So we're going to go through three cases in increasing complexity. There'll be polls, so please have your thumbs already, and we'll have lots of time for conversation. My disclosure hasn't changed. I attended that 2018 meeting that we have a limited number of medicines that are approved and only for daily use, and we're going to talk about other things. So let's jump into the case. This is a new patient, initial prep visit. He's a 26-year-old cisgender man who has sex with other men who moved to the city three months ago. Since moving, he tells you he has had condomless, receptive, and insertive sex every other day or so with about a total of 50 partners. Last condomless sex was last night. He has no known medical history, takes no medications, and has no substance use, and you did a point-of-care HIV test in the clinic, and it was negative. Case one, does he need PEP? So your options are, what do you do? You prescribe nothing and just repeat testing in two to three weeks. You draw labs and prescribe neither PEP or PrEP while waiting for results. Three is draw labs, prescribe PrEP, and schedule a follow-up in one month for repeat testing, or draw labs, prescribe PEP, post-exposure prophylaxis for 28 days. What do you do? So majority saying prescribe PEP, about a third saying prescribe PrEP, and a small number saying wait for your test results. I'll go on and then we can go back to why people chose what they chose. I think the majority chose the correct answer. I think this is a time where PAP or post-exposure prophylaxis is indicated for 28 days with then a plan to step down to PrEP. But I think that it is a little bit complicated because of this issue of repeat exposures. And this came up in, and as a conversation with another provider that I had who wouldn't have done PEP for this reason. And as you may or may not remember from the NPEP guidelines, which were updated a few years ago, to recommend NPEP only for infrequent exposures, but that people with frequent and recurrent exposures should not be prescribed re frequent repeated courses of NPEP. With a caveat that in those situations that folks should be on, rather than having a basically a continuous course of three drug therapy, they, they should be on PrEP. But I think the key here is that if the most recent exposure is within the 72 hours, and his was the last night, that non-occupational post-exposure prophylaxis, so three medicines, may be indicated with that transition to PrEP after completion of 28 days of NPEP. And so it's the thing that's slightly confusing here is that he'd had multiple exposures, including the night before. But when you take him at sort of for everything, his exposure the night before warrants PEP, and then he clearly needs to be on PrEP. I think waiting for either PEP or PrEP is not the right answer, and waiting for repeat testing is not the right answer. You know, his the point-of-care test that we did in the clinic there is, you know, it's not going to account for his exposures that have been recently, but the reason to do three drugs and not two drugs is that if he is already been HIV positive, that three drugs would be treating it. I'm going to just move on, I think, to the case two. They get a little bit more complicated as we go through, but so this is an established patient for an interim PrEP visit. He's 44, cisgender man, who was concerned because he attended a small sex party 
with five other men two nights ago. So yesterday, another friend from the party told them that a third attendee from the party with whom they both had condomless receptive sex is HIV positive and not taking antiretroviral therapy. In terms of his PrEP use, he's been prescribed Discovy over the last year, and he's completed his regular quarterly follow-up. He says he missed two doses just in the last week because he was stressed about COVID and he contemplated stopping PrEP, but he has not missed any other doses in the last month. So also for him, no past medical history, no other meds other than his PrEP, and no substance use. So for him, again, another poll, does he need PEP? So use, number one, stop all of his medicines and retest him in one month. Two, reassure him that PEP, the third drug, is not needed and continue him on two-drug PrEP. Three, prescribe PEP for 28 days and then go back down to PrEP immediately. Or four, prescribe PEP, a third drug, for 28 days, then retest him at 6 and 12 weeks after the exposures before restarting his PrEP. Please fill in your best answers. So again, just over half saying reassure him that PEP is not needed and continue PrEP with about an even split between just adding a third drug for the month and then stepping back down and a good minority who say prescribe PEP but then keep him off PrEP for some number of weeks in order to do adequate testing. So If we could move forward with this one, and there are two things, I think, to think about in here. First is, has he been on adequate dosing of his PrEP? We know that PrEP protects extremely well against HIV acquisition in the setting of sufficient drug levels. So what I've quoted from you here is that IAS USA guidelines that just got updated and I talked about last month, they define non-adherence for the purposes of PEP as for men who have sex with men and transgender women that non-adherence is defined as under four doses per week average. And then PEP is recommended in the setting of non-adherence. But the, the thing I want to also point out Even though he meets criteria for being adherent, he does not meet criteria for not adherence, is that these two are based on limited or weak support based on cohort and control studies. And that data comes from primarily, I think we use the IPREX open label extension, IPREX OLAY data, in which they looked at levels in dry blood spots of people on the study and the number of people who seroconverted it in each of those groups. And that protection in that cohort was 100%. There were no infections in anyone. And again, these were cisgender men and transgender women in the study. Anyone who had what appeared to be at least four doses per week. And that's the basis for this recommendation I can go several ways on this. I'd, I'd again, love the opportunity if people want to share what their thinking was for this. I think the other way to think about it is, you know, the the evidence is not really strong. And if someone came to me and was very, very worried, I think it's reasonable to do 28 days of PEP for him, add that third drug, and then step back down for him. Again, I think reassuring people exactly as Marvin was saying, that this is the reason why you are on PrEP and it's just reinforcing about taking the medicines and taking them every day. I think the other thing that you could explore with this gentleman is the reason that he was thinking about stopping and whether or not he's sort of thinking about continuing to go forward as sort of we're in this uncertain situation of social isolation versus sort of continuing the activities that he had been doing that put him at risk of being exposed to HIV. And I think that's the other thing about this case is just sort of thinking, you've been doing the right thing, but let's talk about why maybe you might think about stopping and whether that's the right thing or not. Okay. The third one is a little bit more complicated. So I, I'd love to sort of take a moment and just have you look at this as I talk through it. Um, but the third is a 35-year-old cisgender man who's in follow-up to your clinic from an emergency room visit for PEP when PEP was started. He had discontinued PrEP 
due to COVID, but decided to restart Truvada and had talked about two-on-one dosing and decided to restart with two-on-one dosing. So on day one, we presume this was anticipation of sex. He took two pills, but didn't actually have sex that day. And then on day two and day three, took an additional pill. Three days later, decided, you know, for whatever reason, we're not going to take any pills. So there are three days off prep. And then restarted on day seven with one pill. And then on day eight, takes a pill and then has condomless receptive anal sex with a partner of unknown HIV status. The next day, continues with the pills, has condomless receptive anal sex, same partner. And then on day 10, gets counseled and thinks about it and goes to the ER for a visit for PEP, where what he was prescribed was m Tenofovir does a prosofumerate and ritonavir boosted lopinavir. He has depression and takes St. John's wort. So I'm going to go and I think re, if we can read the questions, but then go back to the case so people can look at it and think about it, if that's something that we can do. I'm going to move forward. So does he need PEP? So yes, he needs PEP and he should continue these medicines for 28 days and then go back to PrEP. Alternative two is, yes, he needs PEP, but we need to switch to FTC TDF dolutegravir for 28 days and then go to PrEP. No, he doesn't need PEP, but he needs to be on Truvada for at least another 28 days, or no, and he can continue with 2-1-1 dosing. This is the more complicated case of the three. So that vast majority here think PEP but switch to a dolutegravir-based PEP regimen and then go back to PrEP. But in terms of the 2-1-1 strategy, again, it's a two pills, two to 24 hours before sex, one pill 24 hours later, one pill 24 hours that. But the thing that Hillary had to point out to me in the protocol for, for Ypergay was that if you are anticipating sex, within the first within a week of having taken your pills before that you only restart with one pill so he was actually fully adherent to the epergue protocol by taking that one pill at day 7 and then the other thing when i look at this is sort of if you go back and think how many pills does he need in the week before exposure that he needs four pills, and he sort of also is already there. Although, you know, he makes, having missed three pills in the middle of the week makes me a little bit uncomfortable. But I think one could argue that he's fully protected using the Ypergay strategy, minus the St. John's Ward, if there's a significant St. John's Ward Tanofvir interaction. And I don't actually know if that was studied as part of Ypergay and in that work. I'm not sure I have another slide after that. I just have the recommendations again from IAS USA. This is the same slide from the talk I gave, just about how long someone needs to be on PrEP and how many days you have to continue. And again, according to the Ypergay protocol, that for cisgender men who have sex with men, it's two days after the last at-risk exposure and not the 28 days that I think many of us had conservatively recommended well at the beginning of PrEP. I think that's the main thing. Also, of course, that two-on-one dosing recommended only for cisgender men, according to IAS USA, and only using FTC TDF and not FTC TAF. I'm going to stop sharing, and we can answer any additional questions. Thank you for watching this edition of the Mountain West AETC Project Echo Didactic Series. If you like this talk, please click the red subscribe button and please check out other talks in our series. Until next time, this is Brian Wood, Medical Director, signing off.